All right, it's looking close. I'm gonna make sure, and I'm gonna get my best friend here, Mr. Microfiber. I'm just gonna hand rub that a little bit. My transition is good. I'm still hazy out here. Which I can be a little more aggressive on, but I'm, I'm kind of digging the way this is turning out. And here's the other thing too. You gotta remember that if you go too far, you've gone too far and you've ruined the repair. This is a very delicate operation to get the illusion that you've got a, a continuous coat of clear here. So take baby steps on this if you're doing this repair. So. And this could go this way live too. We just, we don't know. I'm hoping it doesn't. Low RPM, reasonably light pressure. All right. Well, there we go. Okay, Ken can get all over that like a spider monkey. You can't see that transition any longer. And Ken, get back to maybe a medium shot where you can see the difference here. You can see where it's hazy here and then it disappears there. Yeah, yeah, we can see the difference there. So that is how you can fool the person looking into believing that you hadn't spotted that in. Now, I want to be careful advising that you should do this because I, I want to say again that it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary fix. And it'll get you by for a season on your rockers, on your leading edges, um, on the inside edges of your wheel arches if you're an autocross freak like I am. And you want to get past, uh, you know, just kind of roll the tape back just like we're doing on the hood sides. And, um, you know, get you through another season before you break into the paint again. Let's go unmask our, our project here. So it's a temporary fix, but it's a good temporary fix. And what I'm doing is just taking off what I've masked up. Typically, I leave this alone, but I want to show you a technique. It's important for unmasking when you've got a, a delicate and a fresh clear coat. Basically what you're doing is pulling away from the clear. All right, now what do we got? We got an edge there, we got an edge there. We've got a polishable edge there and a transition there. When I hit this, I'll probably hand rub that, but when I hit that and polish that out, nobody's gonna be able to look at that hood and say, that clear coat's flaking. It's band-aided, it's buried. That. In the racing world, you call that a field fix. <coughs> that is a very effective field fix. So we just showed you what can't be done. We showed you how to do what can't be done. We showed you why it shouldn't be done, but we went ahead and showed you how to do it anyway. So, so you know, should I feel guilty about that? I don't know. Um, no, I don't because there's more than one way to, you know, to, to skin a chicken and, and um, sometimes you've got to resort to things that maybe aren't in the rule books. I always say you have to know the rules before you can know how to effectively ba bend or break them. So, you know, the uh, shameless plug here, sorry guys, Eastwood execs can get mad at me if they want to. The Paint Education Instructional DVD series uh, show you the fundamentals. They show you the rules. They show you a, a definitely really good right way to do a lot of these procedures and to do it correctly. But sometimes, you know, your circumstances don't, uh, don't allow for an entire paint job. So stuff like that, stuff like the fender over there, that can be a very effective fix. So I want to reach out to the guys um, back, in, uh, back in PA uh, with the, the power of the internet and, and ask if there's, uh, if there's any questions, if, any, if anybody has uh, you know, written in any questions. Uh, we've got a bit of a time delay, so while they're catching up with what I'm asking them, I also wanted to mention the tack rag that I forgot to use. <laughs> I had it open, I had this prepared. Um, these tack rags, these crystal tack rags uh, are the best tack rags I've ever used because they're a low tack, they're huge, it's a really nice cheesecloth and it's not, uh, it's not gummy. The way to use a tack rag is to open it up 
let it air out, let's, let some of that tack go down. I'm getting a call in. Hey, I'm here. Hey. Okay, good, we've got some questions. Okay, 10-4. I've got a really good question, but I want to finish my thought on this. So after you've, you've spread your tack rag out, let it air out a little bit. Let it get acclimated. Let some of that tack disperse. And then you come by, you fold it. You don't wad it all up. Fold it. Keep rolling it. And that's the proper way to use a tack rag. And truthfully, you know, I mean, this area was so tiny that, you know, when I wiped it off with the cleaners, it's going to be fine. And if you're going to rub, the, you, what you don't want to do is trap anything under the clear. So that's the correct way to unfold and use a tack rag. And again, these crystal tack rags are available from Eastwood and they're beautiful. It's the best ones I've ever used. No endorsement. I don't get paid a dime for that. But um, the question was, and I need my Sharpie. The question was, when we're doing a clear coat repair like that and you have to spot a little bit of base coat in because it looks like that, it looks like pure butt, um, you got to spot a little bit of color in. What do you want to do? How do you do that? So let's just, here is our transition for our clear. I'll just draw on it. It doesn't matter. I can buff that off. So what you want to do is leave enough room between your transition and your buffing and the base coat. You don't want to base right up to here. So what you want to do is engineer your edge way past, about two-thirds past your repair. Let's say that my base coat, first coat was here, second coat was here, then I blended it out here, and I did a drop pressure coat and blended it out there. I would still be okay. I'd still be in the zone for repairing that and for buffing my edge and creating the illusion of a transition there, of, a, of a, a, a complete clear coat. But if I brought my base coat out to here, what you would see would be the, uh, it would be the, the base coat basically unfolding. The structure of base coat is that the, the flakes kind of lie on top, and when you dive into them with compound or sandpaper, it shows. So you'd end up with, with a real clear halo around that repair if you didn't protect it well enough with the clear coat. So great question. If you have to apply base, what do you do? Well, you apply your base, you feather it out, and then you create your... your yeah, you have to think about it ahead of time. But you go way past it, you protect that base coat at all costs, blend it out properly, bring your clear coat, clear coat out past it. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, have we got anything else? Anybody else asking stuff? Great. <coughs> A great question. The question is, how long do you have to wait to cut and rub clear coat? And the truth is, there are many, many, many different answers to that question. Typically, if you're using a clear coat that's designed for an all-over paint job, you can get on it in as little as you know, 12 to 14 hours. The truth is, it's real soft then. If you're doing a spot job, if you're in collision repair um, and you're wanting to kick it out the door, then you're probably using a faster clear and you can get on it that soon. But what happens typically is that there's a 90 day cure window for catalyzed clear coat and it's gonna shrink, it just does. Clear coat shrinks as it cures. The solvents evacuate, they outgas, and your, your material shrinks, it gets down smaller. So if you cut that and you buff it, it's gonna continue shrinking and sometimes you can get haze back. It'll get cloudy looking and it has to be rebuffed later. So what should you do on an all over paint job? Here's what I do when I'm doing a show car. If I paint a car, I'm gonna cut it and I'm gonna leave it for a week. Let it outgas because when you knock that top off, um, you're, you're allowing all those solvents to evacuate off of that panel. Leave it a week, come back, clean it, and then buff it. It may be a little bit harder to buff, but you know that you're gonna bring it up to gloss one time, and you're not gonna have to go back. It's not gonna cloud up and ghost up. Now, like I said, there's many answers to that question. I won't belabor this, but if you're using a speed clear or a panel clear, or even the 2K Aerospray, um, it says that you can get on it within a, within a few hours. If you're doing jams and you've got a, a, a fast clear coat, you can, you can effectively, there's some clear coats in, in production shops that you can get on and rub in two hours and safely kick it out the door. Um, you pay a high premium for those products. 
in my opinion, you're still flirting with disaster. Um, I think, you know, typically go to your pea sheets. There's always a recommendation for a cut and rub time. Your pea sheets will tell you that. But general rule of thumb is at least 24 to 48 hours, then come in and cut and rub. If you're doing a show car, leave it a week. Cut it open, let it out gas, leave it a week, and come back and buff, and you'll only have to do it once. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> the question is, should you use a rotary buffer like the one I showed you or an orbital buffer? Now typically, I would, I would normally say, if this was five years ago, I'd say go rotary 100% because it cuts harder. It, it's, it, you're, you're compounding, you're resurfacing, you're, you're sanding, compounding, and bringing back up to gloss. You're literally resurfacing that finish. And an orbital buffer is like a dual action sander. It orbits as well as it spins, and it's just not as aggressive. However, there are technologies now for, um, for orbital or two-stage buffers that uh, will cut every bit as good. There's the cyclo polishers that you can find at East with. It's a dual polisher. My first experience with this was um, some guys from a company called Swift Aircraft in, uh, in northern Tennessee. When I was doing a, a TV series on the DIY network called Classic Rides, we restored a vintage Airstream trailer. Trailer. And it was 24 feet long. It was an overlander. And um, we buffed that thing. We buffed that aluminum trailer to where it looked like the fuselage of, of a, a World War II airplane. And the, the guys from Swift, Swift Aircrafts came over and they showed us the technique for that. There's, a, there's a, a sanding, there's a compounding, there's a final buff technique. And it was fascinating. It was fascinating. And we used a cyclo polisher for that. So what I recommend is, it's because what I'm used to, it's because what I was trained to do. I like the, I like the rotary buffers while I'm cutting, while I'm surfacing down, when I get up to gloss. Now from there, I will use a semi-aggressive compound on an orbital buffer to de-swirl the car. Um, so I use a combination of both. Um, I've got an electric one. I don't have an air-powered orbital buffer, but uh, I've, uh, my electric one works just great. And that's what I use, especially on a dark color, to de-swirl the car. But for basic cut and rub, I use rotary. Um, I think that may be a really, a really good question that might inspire a bit of a revision on the color sanding and buffing video, or perhaps we do an online video with a cyclo polisher uh, on the Eastwood website. So thanks for asking that question. Um, again, my answer, if you're going to cut and rub, if you're going to resurface the car, cut nib trash, all that kind of stuff, use a rotary buffer, get it flat, and then come back and de-swirl with an orbital just to fine tune and finish out the process. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. <coughs> Can you use um, the the? Uh, Can you know, we? I'm 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 a little confused. Uh, can we use Eastwood two stage paint? Can you ask a question again? Hmm. Maybe they're talking about the single stage urethane and clear coat on top of that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think I understand it better. There is a window to shoot the clear. I can't recite the piece sheet. Okay, here's a question. Can you, you, if you're doing a single stage paint job, which is the gloss and the color all in one, uh, not a two step like a base coat clear coat, if you're doing a single stage paint job, can you put clear on top of it? Yes, yes you can. Um, what is the window for that? Well, the piece sheet will clearly tell you that, but I think it's, uh, correct me guys if I'm wrong, I think it's within 12 hours you gotta recoat that sucker uh, in order for the chemicals to cross link so you don't have that on the hood with a layer sitting on top of a layer that's destined for failure. Because within, I think within that 12 hour period, you'll still get a chemical crosslink of your single stage color coat and your clear coat on top. Here's what I like to do. When, I, when I'm doing a single stage paint job, I wanna layer it up. I wanna, okay, so here's, here's my ground coat. Um, I got a sealer coat. Here's my color coat. That's 100% color. 
my, uh, once I get hiding up to that, once I'm done with my paint job, um, what I'm going to do is take, I'm going to take my color and I'm going to take a compatible clear coat and I'm going to mix them up individually, mix color, mix clear, and mix them together in a cup 50-50 and then I've got my 50-50 mix right there on top. And then what I'm going to do is my next coat is going to be 75% clear, 25% color. And then I'm going to come back with 100% clear coat. So what that does, when the light hits this, this is a really interesting effect. It's called refraction. And it's why a candy job looks so deep and so nice. It's why when you look at video of the water in the Bahamas, that's why it looks beautiful to us. The sunlight is going to come down and disperse into here before it bounces back up and hits your eye. It softens the light. It's not a direct reflection. It's a refraction of all of this stuff in here. When you've got clear, a little bit of color and lots of clear, half color, half clear, and then 100% color here, it softens the look of it. So what does that do as well? Now on the top, I've got 100% clear coat, so I can cut and rub this now. If I'm just color here and I start aggressively cutting and rubbing, I'm getting down into the pigment. And just like I talked about on that clear coat blend, when you bring your base coat too far out, you're sacrificing the color. You've stripped off all of your UV protection and you're digging into the color and it's going gonna, it's gonna to model. It's going to stripe on you. So what that does is you layer it up. And I know this is a long answer, but if you layer it up, that's a way to treat that demon to where you can tame it. Layer it up. Create the refraction you want. I've had the most beautiful, soft, glowing finishes out of like a robin egg blue I did on an old Fairlane one time, and it just it just really popped, and it was a very nice trick. Uh, a, a guy that I can't remember his name right now talked to me about this and and taught me how to do that. So if you want to treat it like a base clear, my suggestion is get a base clear system. Don't use single stage urethane and put a clear on top of it. You know, unless there's a real good reason to do that. The color is not available in a base clear formula. Um, but if you're going to do base clear, commit to base clear. If you're going to do single stage, use single stage, but then treat it to where you can do the repair that you need on it. If you're like a lot of guys out there, uh, you have a home painting environment, you're going to have to deal with contamination. The best paint booths in the world, you're still going to get contamination. So I always like to buff clear coat and leave myself some room to enhance that that uh, that finish. So I hope that answers the question. I know it was long-winded, but hopefully I can share a technique with you guys too. <coughs> okay, great question. The last question that we're going to talk about today is on a full restoration, are you going to cut and rub before you put the glass and the trim back on the car? And my question is absolutely 100% yes. Yes, I am. The reason being is that if you've got windshield trim or emblems or badges or something like that, well, you're restricting the surface that you can buff. Think about it like this. When these cars were assembled, they were shot down a paint line as a body. Some of them were, were dipped in, the, in the, the primers, and and it was shot down a paint line. Now it's all robotics, but there's no glass. There's no interior in it. There's no emblems on it. And to recreate or to mimic the process of the factory, which is what we're trying to do anyways with restorations, we're trying to enhance that with custom stuff, but we're trying to recreate what the factory did. So if you think about it like that, the factory didn't have windshield moldings on. It didn't have the glass in. And so that paint could get into all of those cracks and crevices and areas. Uh, so that was the reason for them being like that. And when they do surface prep at the factory, because they do cut and rub at the factory on final paint lines and final inspection lines, um, you know, the stuff isn't, isn't all completely assembled. So my recommendation is do your cut and rub before assembly. It gives you a much um, easier way to clean those compounds out uh, of the crevices and cracks. And and it's, it's just a lot easier to do. There's less to think about. You don't have to worry about your edges so much. And your emblems, if they're plastic emblems, like this Ford Ranger emblem right here, if I had dust and trash and I had that emblem on there, I'm going to have a halo of either orange peel or stuff around that emblem that I can't possibly buff. So um, th that to me is a, that's a pretty simple thing to, to, to conceive of. You know, think about the car going down the assembly line. Nothing's on it. You cut and rub it. Then you put it back together. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a cool signal in my ear that uh, that's all we have time for. I want to thank you guys for watching this live stream event. Um, 
we're going to be doing lots more of these things in the future with all kinds of really cool media stuff coming up. Uh, Eastwood TV, we're doing some stuff I can't even tell you about, but it involves a really bitchin' car. And um, I don't know. There's lots of great stuff coming up. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching live. And thank you for watching after the fact on the website. And uh, keep the questions coming in. Uh, we're also on the Shop Talk podcast that I do, the interview show that I do, that's available on iTunes and from Eastwood on download. Um, we're, we're giving away prizes if you guys uh, email me questions. If we read your question on the air, there's great, great prizes. So keep that in mind, too. And remember that everything that we've used today in this demo, um, it can make you money or it can save you some heartache. And it's all available from the Eastwood Company. So super, super big thanks to Eastwood and everybody up in PA. Thank you for you guys watching. And um, we will see you on the next live stream. Um, I've got some cleanup to do. I've got to get all this ink off the fender, so I've got to go.